welcome all of you to our decoding talk, of which we're really going to talk about one piece of software. This is relatively rare for our decoding talk series. We're going to talk Energy Pro and how our modeling regimes and how our documentation processes are changing because of the code updates associated with the 2019 code. And we are just talking about low-rise residential in this particular session. We are recording the session. We record all of our sessions, and then we take the best of, uh, of the series and put them on our website for people to maybe view again because it maybe went so fast or have other people in their office view because they weren't able to attend. All of our decoding talks are available on the Energy Code Ace website. Our last decoding talk was on healthcare because occupancy I2 is now subject to the Energy Code requirements with a lot of exceptions. So if you do that type of work, you might want to get up to date on that. And I have a few other decoding talks that I'm highlighting because I think they're of value for those of us who are attending this particular decoding talk. Residential compliance is all about how we need to get design sets and design of buildings to meet more the promise of the CF1Rs. Don't have the CF1Rs do the heavy lifting. Have the design documents do the heavy lifting. QII, quality insulation, installation is verified by a HERS rater is a, is a whole new ball game in this code cycle and we really dive deep in what does that mean for design, for energy calculations, and for in the field um, install for insulation. And then if you want to get caught up on what's new for this code cycle, Martin and I did a series, one on res, one on non-res, what's coming, uh, our personal opinions about the impact of some of these new code requirements. And there's also some other recordings just of Martin on what's coming for the next code cycle where he kind of dives a little bit deeper into those code requirements. We are brought to you by Energy Code ACE. We are funded by you, the ratepayers of California. So thank you very much. And we are administered through the investor-owned utilities. Uh, PG&E is, uh, is the utility that really supports the decoding talk series. And we are regulated under the auspices of the California Public Utilities Commission. I am Gina Rada. I'm the host for the Decoding Talk series, and I'm an energy consultant. All of us have like gone a, a certain pathway to get where we are, and I don't think any of us started saying, I'm going to be an energy consultant, because that field just didn't even really exist way back in the 90s. <laughs> I love the fact that there are schools that offer this as a degree now. I know Sonoma State has had a program for quite a long time. And Martin, you and your family have been very involved in that Sonoma State program. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background. Yep. So actually, speaking of not, not intended to be an energy consultant, when I came, came out of Cal Architecture School, I had every intent of being an architect. Uh, that uh, sort of diverged into the, uh, the Title 24 field when I met uh, my old partner, Mike Gable. And uh, back then, we had this, this bright idea that filling out Title 24 forms was tedious. And why not uh, write a computer program to fill out Title 24 forms? So that was the the origin of uh, Comply 24, which was the uh, the prior version of uh, Energy Pro. That was the DOS version, and then of course Energy Pro came out. Uh, I guess it was about '96 when we came out with Energy Pro and started uh, dealing with uh, that funny thing called the Windows operating system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, but you know the the basic intent of the software has been over the years. To really make your, you know, process of documenting compliance with the various codes as as simple as straightforward as possible, and you know, it's it's, it's obviously getting more complicated to to meet the new codes and and uh, and to document these things, things like batteries, PV systems. Now we're talking about shading on PV systems, etc. So all I can say is that uh, it's getting harder for you. It's getting harder for everybody else. So uh, don't take it personally. But uh, we'll all be moving ahead as the changes go forward and, uh, you know, basically learning a lot uh, based upon, you know, just discussions with people on the code and that type of thing. So. But the fact that our code changes every three years and our software changes every three days, uh, we honestly really have to keep up on things. This is a quickly moving industry. And um, self-education is imperative. <laughs> I just, there is not a day I'm not learning. I, I am not an expert in any one field, but I do read a lot. Our goals for you today is to really talk about residential, and that includes single-family homes, low-rise multifamily buildings at three habitable stories or less, 
duplexes of any size and townhomes three stories, three habitable stories or less. We're going to be talking about compliance options that you might be using more often because of this code cycle. So not only just the updates, but things that have been there all along that you might start using a little bit more often. We're really going to tie things back to the compliance documentation, the CF1R, and what does all that modeling look like and should look like in the CF1R. So this is to really help our building departments understand how the design is being supported. And one two-hour webinar is not going to be enough where you can go to continue to get education about the code and the software. Here's a quick overview of our agenda. We are going to use every single minute, let me tell you, so I sure hope that you are prepared for the two hours with us. Now that we've talked a little bit about ourselves, Martin and I would like to know a little bit about you. So if you could tell us what role you serve, this helps us understand who is in the room with us today and how best to meet your needs. And then how would you rate your skill level with Energy Pro? Just so we know how quickly, how deep, and maybe how often we might have to dive in a little bit further or not. And then my last question for you is going to be, how is CBEC, comma res, and Energy Pro related to each other? Wow, we have across the board this afternoon, Martin. Still quite a few energy consultants, but almost just as many engineers and contractors. Yay, we always love having contractors in the room. A nice mix here. Yep. Yep, I'm surprised there's not a few more HERS Raiders, but uh, maybe they're, they've got it uh, dialed in. Or maybe they're a combination of consultants and Raiders there. If you don't see uh, your role, please f do feel free to type it into the webinar chat just so you can introduce yourself and how you're part of the conversation today. And we have people, most of the people today are feeling moderately skilled in Energy Pro. And I have to say, I, I should consider myself highly skilled, but every single co uh, software update, I feel like I'm back to moderate. <laughs> For those of you who are new, you might feel a little overwhelmed. So we're really going to tell you where you can dive a little bit deeper in understanding um, compliance software modeling. So hang in there for the ride. It's going to be worth it. Martin, what do you think about our responses about uh, the relationship between CBEC and Energy Pro? Um, yes, they both do report <laughs> reports, but uh, that's, that's probably a given. Um, I think somebody says, says it correctly, where CBEC res is the underlying engine that Energy Pro is built on for the CEC rules. Yeah, and that's a very important point to understand. Um, whether you use CBEC Res, whether you use Energy Pro, if you do identical inputs, you will get identical answers. You'll get identical reports. Everything about it will be exactly the same. So it really comes down to uh, you know, your preference as far as the, the modeling tool, the interface, and that type of thing. But uh, I can't say that Energy Pro can do this and you know, CBEC Res cannot when it comes to Title 44 at least. Um, but same, same, same thing on the other side. You know? See, the grass can do stuff, Energy Pro can do the same things. It's all built around the same engine. I am one of those who feels that understanding the underlying structure behind under your tools only makes you a better energy consultant. So you're going to hear often from me that even though you might be an Energy Pro user, it's well worth your time to learn a little bit about CBEC Res because it's going to help you understand Energy Pro more. And it makes you more full rounded uh, software user. Thank you, everyone. Let's go back to our presentation. And let's start with the, hey, why are we here today? I always do this with each decoding talk. Sometimes I get people going, just go straight to the meat of things. But first of all, let's talk about our handout. We put together a handout in your last email you got from us. There was the opportunity to go download your handouts. We have non-res and res supported in that handout. Let's just jump to residential right now. So you'll get the what's new for 2019 fact sheet that's supported by Energy Code Ace just to get you up to date on the code requirements. But then there's also a handout that walks through those new code requirements, PV, envelope, mechanical, et cetera, and then dives into where exactly in Energy Pro on the building tree within the overall mapping of Energy Pro, you're going to go about modeling those specific building features. I'm really hoping all of you will have this available in front of you as we go through 
our presentation because it's going to be your cheat sheet for after today. But you're going, ah, I can't find that email that has that link to the handouts. Everyone move their eyes to the left-hand side of the screen, and you'll see Gina's favorite resources. The very first one is Energy Code Ace, well, because I kind of have to bring you to my website at least once. The second one takes you directly to the 2019 section of the Energy Commission's website that fully supports everything available for 2019. Next down is where on the Energy Commission's website you can see the list of approved software. Um, this is well worth um, earmarking or bookmarking it because it's worth going back to and seeing what is going on in terms of approved software. And I love it because it gives us with CBEC Res a kind of a what's new with the software change that helps you understand some of the new nuances incorporated into your new version of Energy Pro. Energy Soft, because all of you should know how to get to that website, but it is fully supported within their software. And then the very last one is Handouts. If you click that, it will open up a separate browser and automatically download a zip file that will have all of these lovely pages you see in front of you for you to hopefully use as we're going through our, our particular material today. We're talking about the 2019 code. Uh, Martin, what projects have to meet the 2019 code? Okay, so it's all based upon your permit application date. And this is a very important distinction here. So if you are in fact in for permit uh, application in, in the uh, 2019 time period, then you would remain under the 2016 code. This is kind of interesting, Gina, because I just had a project come into the office here the other day, and they said, oh, we went in for structural uh, permit already, so we're still under the 2016 code. You guys don't have to do 2019. I said, okay, good to know, good to know. So it's always good to understand that uh, that permit, permitting application date is what's used. So going forward, January 1, 2020, until December 31st, 2022, anything permitting, uh, applying for permit in that time period is going to be under the 2019 code. And we do know that the 2022 code is coming on January 1, 2023. And that, of course, is just under development now, which also raises a very good point. A lot of people say to me, what the heck were those guys thinking when they put that into this code <laughs> site? Okay, and I say, look, you guys had time to, to you know, put in public comment on the 2019 code cycle development. You did Okay, so now's your opportunity. You can see about getting that changed in the 2022 code cycle. My story behind that is the 2013 code cycle. It changed my life because I'm the person who went, who thought up this stuff? And I was told, get involved. So since the 2013 code cycle, I have been very, very involved in code development. And it changes, honestly, how I look at life, how I look at my projects. And um, I, join me. Get involved with the next code uh, cycle. Multifamily is going to really see a big change as opposed to what we see under the current 2019 code. Reference ACE. Reference ACE is a tool available through Energy Code ACE. I have it linked uh, as a bookmark on my computer. I have it as an app on my phone. I use it every year, everywhere. I use it about 20 times a day. It's electronic versions of the standards, both the res and the non-res manuals, plus the reference appendices manual, which is extremely important in understanding the PV and battery install requirements. We have two new chapters, JA11 regarding PV. It, that kind of was there under 2016, but they kind of fleshed it out a bit. And what's brand spanking new is JA12, which is regarding the battery install requirements in the field. And then there's also two more manuals called the ACMs. Martin, why is this so important for our audience today? The alternative calculation method manuals basically give us all of the rules that the software is required to, to uh, follow when they're doing a Title 24 calculation. So you can go out and you get any old piece of software and you can run calculations with it, but if the software is going to be approved by the California Energy Commission for use with Title 24, it has to follow the rules given in that manual. And there may be rules in there that you say, well, you know, why is it that way? Why is it that way? For instance, there's a rule that says your thermostat is going to be set at 78 degrees for cooling. And you say, well, I want to set it to 83 degrees because that's where it keeps the thermostat. No, the ACM manual says you can't change that. That's typical thermostat set point, and that's what's going to be used in your calculations. 
So anyway, it kind of gives you the background on that sort of stuff. And Kim is pointing out that these aren't currently yet available on the reference phase. They will be any day now. I can't wait for them to be there because I hate the fact that I have to keep looking up the PDF document that's available on the Energy Commission's website right now. That's what I use. Hopefully this will be, uh, I know they're working on it hard to get that in there soon. Here are some of our favorite resources available to the Energy Commission website. Their hotline is a great resource. I strongly suggest emailing them to get the written record. Next, we have uh, some list uh, listservs. These are their email mailing lists, and we have the blueprint here. Martin, why does everyone need to be on the blueprint listserv? There's a lot of important interpretations and uh, clarifications that are given by the Energy Commission. Those don't always appear in any of the, uh, the compliance documents, you know, the non-res manual, the res manual, etc. So you will see important things. A good example, there was a very important blueprint that clarified the rules for dealing with ADUs, accessory dwelling units. So if you haven't seen that one, you really should get your hands on that one. And there's been a lot of other ones come out that, uh, that give us these clarifications. So you can sign up for it there and you'll get that in your inbox uh, on a periodic basis. Also, we have here the best link uh, to use to get onto the Energy Commission's website, which is directly to their online resource center. So they've redesigned uh, their website in the last six months. I'm still getting used to it. And there's a big button here that's for 2019. If you go down below, you'd also, let's say you only want to hear, um, look what's available for HVAC, you can go to the HVAC button versus the lighting button. But I want to go straight to 2019, and it takes me to this landing page on, the web, on their website that's just about the 2019 standards. I can go here to download that copy of the standards of the manuals. And here's where I can go to find the list of certified software. And this is also where I can get a PDF copy of those ACM manuals that's so very important. And this is what it uh, looked like earlier last week. I have a feeling it looks a little bit different now. And um, tell us about what version software people should be using for Energy Pro right now, Martin. Well, the latest version we've got out is uh, version 8.04. And that was actually released earlier this week. Uh, however, everybody needs to be aware that there are at least two more uh, versions coming, and that's because the Energy Commission is making some uh, fairly, what I consider fairly significant changes, uh, enhancements. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those later today in this presentation. Um, so we're guaranteed to be coming out with an 8.05. Um, from what the CEC tells me, they'll give me the stuff I need to, in the next week or two. But then also, there's supposed to be some other significant changes being made uh, in the March time frame. So uh, keep an eye out. All I can say is that we know there's a lot of updates. We know it's a little bit overwhelming for you. But it is what it is. Whenever we have such a major code cycle change, it's not unusual that it takes a while to get everything dialed. And a little trick out there, if you're having problems from getting the software update button to work within Energy Pro, um, I strongly recommend then you go to EnergySoft's website and do a download from there and kind of do a fresh uh, uninstall, reinstall. Martin, any other tricks on that? Um, no. Well, yes. Yes, actually. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up. Um, security software. We're just being, seeing some nightmare situations with security software. Uh, one guy was writing in saying, hey, I run a calculation in Energy Pro 8. When I finish the calculation, the software is gone. It disappears. And I said to the guy, look, we, Energy Pro can't delete itself. That's not possible for the software to delete itself. So after he installed it a couple of times and it kept disappearing, he finally got to the bottom of it. His security software was literally going in and just wiping out Energy Pro. So we're seeing situations where select files will suddenly disappear. Security software says, oh, I think that's a virus. Boom, it's gone. And it's like, well, you just broke the whole software program. So try to tone down your security software aggressiveness a little bit, if possible, because this is actually getting worse and worse in terms of um, in terms of this thing going forward with these security issues. And for larger companies like myself, coordinating with your IT to be able to do updates, maybe company wide, so that everyone is updated at the same time. 
the overall hi I hierarchy, I hierarchy, I swear I needed that third cup of coffee, um, hierarchy of Energy Pro. Martin, can you walk us through what's included in your software and some of those favorite menu options people should be aware of? Absolutely. So we've got the software broken down, uh, just like Energy Pro 7, by the way. We kept the look and feel as similar as possible, but uh, we did change the color scheme so you know you're in Energy Pro 8, and that's the blue color scheme. So we've got the building tree, hierarchical description of the building, and uh, we, we basically break that down from the most uh, simplified information, like where the building's located, to more detailed things like where's your particular window. We have the libraries. So we did update the libraries in version 8 to represent newer things in the 2019 code. Things like better high-performance walls, better high-performance attics, etc., as dictated by the code, better windows. As far as calculations go, uh, as I was saying to Gina the, uh, this morning, there's a lot of calculations in there. So we're only going to talk about one of the 13 different calculations that we offer. So Energy Pro can do a whole bunch of other stuff. We'll focus in on just the Res T24 performance-based calculations. And then when it comes to reports, you obviously have the option of selecting the different pages of the reports that you want to include in there, uh, whether or not you want to include things like load calculations, mandatory measures checklists, you name it. So one of the important things I want to make you guys aware of is the e-file example projects. So I've got a whole slew of example projects that we have uh, posted. I gave you an us. arrow there, oh. Martin, for you to use. Okay, thank you. Okay. I got it. All right, so the, the example projects, uh, you know, we've got great examples there. Somebody said to me the other day, how do I model a water source heat pump, not a water source, a heat pump water heater? Okay, take a look at our Z&E example. Not only does it model a heat pump water heater, it is an all-electric home that is meeting zero net energy criteria. So there's a great example for you to take a look at. Okay, let's look under here. Uh, we have the Lifecycle Cost Tool. So the Lifecycle Cost Tool is geared to be able to look at the cost effectiveness of energy efficiency measures. Let's take an example. I decide to uh, put in a 3KW system into my home, and uh, I want to know what's the benefit going to be of bumping that up to, say, 4KW. We could use the Lifecycle Cost Tool to see, am I going to get the money back on the utility end of things to do that, or is, is it not cost effective? That allows you to answer those sort of questions. Okay. And under help, there's a lot of resources here you guys should take advantage of. First off, the contents, okay? That's a complete help system. It's built by a very skilled person who does a lot of help stuff, and uh, she's done a great job on, on the help and continues to update that. Uh, I did point out to the, um, the audience this morning that any time you've got a question on an input, you can position your cursor on that input and then hit the F1 key on your keyboard, and that'll give you what we call context-sensitive help for that particular input. Okay, please, 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 please stay up to date, and um, you can keep your software activated down here by check for updates, okay? So like I said, I'm guaranteeing you there's at least two more updates coming out in the next uh, two months. We have the FAQ. Guys, look in the FAQ first. Unfortunately, a lot of people will write into support, and if it's on a weekend, we're not around, we may not answer your question. Monday. Well, check the FAQ first. 90% of the questions we get are in the Energy Pro FAQ. Okay, and down here we've got copies of the Title 24 documents, the standards, California Code of Regulations, Title 24, Part 6, reference appendices, the Residential Compliance Manual. So these are also great resources for you. <clears throat> And, you know, if you're a beginner and you're on today's class and you're thinking, how can I get more, better understanding of Title 24, take a look at the res manual, okay? It makes for a good, good uh, nighttime reading, you know, when you want to go to sleep quickly at night. <laughs> the res manual. <laughs> but even you high-end users, they completely rewrote the chapter on PV and battery. And almost all the questions I'm getting on PV and battery are 
supported within that chapter in the residential manual. So even though you've been around forever, please do read at least the PV and battery chapter. There's stuff that you're going to learn there, I promise. Okay, now we're going to dive into the building tree and how we're breaking down things. And um, I've, I've harassed Martin for years about, can you please color code what I use for res versus non-res versus it doesn't apply to compliance at all. I did it for him. So if there is no color at all, that means that's a tab or an input that you use for both residential, non-residential, and most likely a non-Title 24 compliance project. If it is orange, that is something that's specific to non-residential only, and you will not use it for residential. If it is green, that is specific only to residential, and you won't use it for non-residential. And gray means you're just not going to use that for Title 24 compliance at all. Martin, can you walk us through the large overview of our building tree and how we are going to use our building tree when we model? Absolutely. I'm going to let you take control of the, of the, of the arrow. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So things at the project level of the building tree up here, top level of the building tree, general information that applies to the whole building. For instance, the building is located in Berkeley. Okay. Things like, I am going to do QII. All right. Well, QII applies to the building. You don't get to say, I need QII in this particular wall. It's either the building's got QII or it doesn't. That's the way it works. Uh, same with photovoltaics. My building will have photovoltaics. So you wouldn't just come along and say my addition has photovoltaics. Plant level of the tree, ability to specify domestic hot water systems. And with the domestic hot water systems, you can put in uh, multipliers on the water heaters. You can also put in different types of water heaters. We'll talk about that a little bit later. At the system level, you have the ability to specify your HVAC systems. It's not unusual for a home to have different types of systems. Here's an existing home with a furnace air conditioner. I'm converting a garage into an ADU. I'm going to add a mini split. I would have two systems there, one for the existing house, another for the new ADU. At the zone level of the tree, <clears throat> we're getting into basic information such as um, what occupancy do you have for this particular zone and things like is this zone existing is it altered is it new that's very important to the title 24 rule sets because they're all treated differently so you might have two zones in a building one for the existing home and the other for the addition that would be example of more than one zone as far as the room level of the building tree goes my approach is to put a single room in for each zone. And that's because I do not care about breaking the building down into individual rooms. However, you may be in a position where you're doing room by room load calculations. That's fine. Now we start to put in a room for the uh, living room. We put in the dining room. We put in the kitchen. Bedroom one, bedroom two, etc. So you can go that far with Energy Pro and break it down into individual room by room load calculations. So this is incorporated in your handout so that you have it after today in terms of this overall color coding. And we're going to dive in a little bit deeper now and really look at what's happening at this project level. Martin, can you walk us through some of these drop downs and how we're going to use it for all projects? Yep, absolutely. First off, guys, you don't use existing. If you've got an existing building, that means you're not doing anything to it. You don't do Title 24 calculations on that. You do Title 24 calculations when you've got a new building. And uh, when we get to the ADU section, let's talk about how that, um, that differs between uh, additions and, and new. There's a designation for addition. The only thing I want to analyze is just the addition. And then, of course, we are analyzing the existing home and the addition as well as any alterations that we may be making. So you go ahead and uh, do that. Hey, Gina, let's do this one since it's such a controversial one. Fuel. I was just going to take you there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we avoided it this morning. Well, guys, there's two choices here. And first thing somebody says to me is, oh, 
I don't have either one. I've got electricity. Well, first there's the thing I'll remind you of is basic physics. Uh, electricity is not a fuel. Okay? So you have two fuels available at the site. Obviously, we don't offer oil <laughs> because uh, we're not back east. So you've got natural gas or propane. Somebody says to me, I don't have either. Sure, it's what's available. It's not what's installed at the site. What is available to you? Is there a natural gas line out in the street? Okay, then natural gas is available to you. There's no natural gas out in the street? Okay, then propane is available to you. I don't have a propane tank. I didn't ask what you have. I asked what is available to you. Very simple question. So let's now talk about what's going on when we do at the zone level, there's a whole new slew of stuff. I don't know about you guys, but this looks a lot different than it did um, in the 2016 software version 7. Can you walk us through this, Martin? Absolutely. So for residential users, uh, there are only a couple of choices on here that we would consider valid. Uncondition is not currently supported by the, the residential tools, and until it is, then you can't cho choose it. You probably say to me, why is it on there? Because it is supported by the non res tools. Okay, so your project is conditioned. You are doing a zonally controlled system, separate res living and res sleeping thermostats. You are doing a residential garage. That's it. Those are the choices you would make there. And I think they're fairly obvious what the choices are. Stay away from these two, the zonal controlled ones, unless you fully understand zonal control systems as outlined in the res compliance manual. Sorry about this. Uh, now there's a, a new way that we're dealing with occupancy. Um, there's a whole bunch more that happens when you click this button, but I want Martin to just speak about the two inputs that apply to our conversation this afternoon. Yep, it's either single family or it's multi-family. And I want to remind everybody that a duplex is not multi-family. It is considered single family. Same with townhomes. Okay? So that means you need to put them into single family. <clears throat> however, however, if you're doing a duplex, you need to do two separate files, one for each duplex. You can't do a single compliance calculation. It requires two. So you might be tempted to call it multi-family so you can combine them all together. That is absolutely wrong, the wrong way to do the, uh, the calculations. And let's talk about ADUs for a moment, Martin. I mean, there's so many questions we've been getting about ADUs and how we go about modeling them. And how we go about modeling them is going to then also affect what code requirements apply to them. Go for it. OK. So guys, everything I'm going to say is outlined in the CEC's blueprint. So if you haven't seen this blueprint issue, then just go find it uh, based upon that link we gave you. Here's the situation. I've got an existing home. I convert an attached garage into an ADU. Okay? That is considered to be an addition, and it's considered to be attached. Scenario two. I've got an existing home, and I punch out and add an addition onto the side. It's going to be an ADU. That is an addition. That is specified as attached. Scenario three, I've got an existing home. I've got a shed out in the backyard. I convert the shed into an ADU. That is considered an addition, and that is considered to be detached. Next scenario, and this will get a little bit confusing for you. I have an existing home. I do a brand new structure in the back. It's not attached to the home. Okay, we're going to mark that building as being new construction up here under building type at the top level of the building tree. And I know this is going to sound a little odd. It's going to document a little odd. For right now, you'd say accessory dwelling unit, no, because it's a freestanding structure as far as we're concerned in that case. And we're going to see what happens, but for right now, that's the only way you're going to get the IAQ bands to, to calculate uh, correctly. We think they may be going to fix it. We're a little vague on this one. So let's check it out in the, in the next update uh, that's coming out in two weeks and see if they address the IAQ issue. Because right now your IAQ fans will report it correctly if you, uh, if you do it that way.
Okay, hoping everyone's feeling a little bit more comfortable of those inputs they'll use for ADU. Uh, Oliver has a scenario number five. A new ADU is attached to a new home addition or new construction separate CF1Rs. Martin, I'm going to let you take this one. Yep. Okay, so what you're going to give me is you're going to treat that just like the duplex scenario. And you're going to go ahead and give me two separate Title 24s, uh, one for the home and one for the second dwelling unit. And of course, they're both new construction, so everybody guess at what they're going to have to do in both cases. They both have to have PV unless it's completely shaded. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I nobody, was hoping that's what you were going for. And nobody says Let's dive into one. PV. <laughs> nobody says it can't be one PV system, by the way. It's just that you have to, you'd have to have, okay, I need uh, one and a half KW for the ADU. I need two and a half for the main house. I'm going to supply a 4KW system. That would be perfectly fine. And there's nothing in the energy code, Oliver, um, I, and I'm not sure if I'm saying your name wrong, so I completely apologize if I'm saying it wrong. Um, nothing in the energy code that says anything about meters. So they could definitely be sharing the same meter. He would look more to the local um, building department, whether they might require a separate meter and or what the utility requirements are and they definitely can be served by the same meter. Let's dive into PV and flexibility a little bit more here and first of all give you an overview on what's going on in terms of what the code requirements are. So existing buildings with additions, existing buildings with additions and alterations, existing buildings with alterations are going to look and feel like they always have because PV is not a requirement nor is it regulated at all for existing, plus addition, plus alterations, and any mixture of those three scenarios. But we have a new way that we're measuring new residential buildings. This could be that new residential home. This could be that new residential ADU unit, and it's called an EDR. Um, Martin, talk to them about what the scoring looks like for an EDR. Absolutely. Uh, it is possible to obviously have a score above 100. But the reference of 100 is the 2006 ICC home. And that's what's used by the rest of the country for HERS ratings. So the Energy Commission chose that scale as 100. They chose a scale of zero to represent, or a score of zero, to represent a home that is a zero net energy home. Chances are on a normal home, you're going to score somewhere in the mid-20s as far as that goes. So if you do have to push further down on the scale, as some jurisdictions will require with their above code ordinances, then obviously you'll need to score somewhere closer to zero on that. Okay. Now, so, what goes into these different EDR scores, Martin? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So you're going to be looking at two particular scores to show your building complies. The first score only looks at the building efficiency. Uh, I like to call it the EDR E for efficiency. That looks at your envelope, IAQ, HDC, DHW, et cetera, et cetera. The second score, the total score, I like to call it the EDRT, rolls in everything, including the photovoltaics and the batteries and all that stuff. You must score both in compliance. Let me explain this by example. Situation, I'm doing this great new house out in Palm Springs, and I love west-facing windows. Put a ton of it up there. Okay, but you know what? I'm going to throw a big old PV system on there, and that's going to take care of all my air conditioning loads. Okay, so we look at the total score, and because of all that PV you're putting on there, it looks great. You're, you're good. But we look at the building efficiency score. It doesn't have PV in there. So suddenly your cooling load is huge. Your air conditioner is using too much energy. You fail. You're out of luck. You have to score on both. Second scenario, we're building one of these new, super energy efficient passive houses, but we're not really mm -hmm. in the PV part of this. So the building efficiency score looks fantastic. However, you don't have any PV uh, there, you're out of compliance. So what you need to do here to get this to work is to balance good building energy efficiency with a reasonable amount of PV production. If you don't do that, then you're going to be out of luck. Okay? So, 
And that PV number is going to be based on condition floor area, climate zone, number of dwelling units, so like an ADU unit like we were just talking about is going to have a higher, you know, it's a separate report even, but for, this is for multifamily. It counts up how many dwelling units we have. And this speaks a little bit to your question, Salah, about how do we know that PV system and its KW sizing and what is it us energy consultants need to know when we're doing the reports? So Martin, can you speak a bit to that in terms of what is it we need to know about the PV system? What type of exceptions do we have and alternative ways of looking at the sizing? Absolutely. Okay, so first off, there is a rule, uh, number one there, that says, okay, if you are substantially shaded, then you do not have to put a PV system in there. Okay, now substantially shaded would be demonstrated by the permit applicants. Here's an example. I'm going to build a new home. It's going to be up in the, up in the uh, Mammoth Lakes and I'm surrounded by 80-foot you know, uh, pine trees. All right, I'm shaded. We get it. Okay, there'd be other, other situations where you might need to prove that where it may be a little bit more difficult. You probably at that point need a solar designer involved to be able to demonstrate substantial shading. I know the Energy Commission is talking about software approval, uh, not, not Energy Pro or CVAC Res, but solar software that would potentially be able to calculate those types of Let's get to the design of the system. Um, you're able to tell me, using Energy Pro, how much solar you need. Okay, that's, you can do that. You can be able to tell, tell me that. It might say you need 3.5 kW as an example. But that's not the whole story. Okay? Where's that PV going to be located on the roof? Do you have enough roof area? Did the architect design a shed roof that faces north? And so you've got really no ability to get a proper PV system up there. These are all considerations. These are all things that need to be worked out as you guys are uh, proceeding to get these things to comply. And the other question is, is the building department going to say to you, give me a fully designed and documented PV system on the plans, on the elevations, on the roofs, etc.? And so that's where you definitely would need to bring in a solar PV company that's able to go through and engineer what's necessary there. I know at our company, um, about a year ago, we reached out to all the PV companies in our area and brought them in and interviewed them and said, okay, we have to have more relationships with each other with all these jobs. And we interviewed the ones we wanted to work with. And I suggest that all of you do that if you're not already a PV contractor totally understanding the nuances of PV design and install. Let's look at what that looks like in terms of modeling. Remember, Martin was telling us earlier, at the project level, when we have something that affects the entire building, it's going to be at the project level. So we're going to let him dive in a little bit deeper then into this PV plus battery tab and walk us through what all these different inputs regarding PV and the PV exceptions and how it applies to our project. OK, guys, yeah, pay attention, because this is a very important topic. Number one, the first option is I want to specify the actual PV size, okay? So I'll go down here and I'll specify my specifics of my array. So here I've got a 1KW array that's located on the east-facing roof. Here's another one, 1KW on the south-facing, 1KW on the west-facing. That's a very specific specification for the PV system. The second one... And that better be supported by a set of PV drawings. Yeah, no kidding. Absolutely. Second one, hey, you know what? I really don't know much about the PV. I want you to just use the standard PV size, the same one that's used in the energy budget building. Okay? It's just a standard size system. That's not a bad way to go because then you can just say, okay, I use the standard design, Mr. Architect, and now you just need to go and get your um, solar contractor to engineer a 3.2 kW system. Maximize. This is my favorite method, I got to tell you. In our office, we're using standard PV size, and we're letting the experts take over from there. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. Maximize the PV credit. Now, this one, you want to kind of be careful here. Uh, what it's basically saying is, look, take a look at all the electricity consumption for my building. 
and go ahead and give me a, a system that will take care of my, all of my electricity. The reason I'm not too hot on that one is that you may not have the roof area to support that system. So you might have gone off and uh, come up with a 5kW system and then suddenly they find out, yeah, we can only fit 4kW up there, not a lot. And then this one I do and I don't like, <laughs> uh, size PV for a target EDR score. Okay, so I have a target for the city of Santa Monica. They want me to get a score on, on the EDR of, say, 14. Okay, and I'm just using this as an example. It's not necessarily true. Okay, so I will tell it that I need 14, and it will size the PV accordingly. Not so hot on that as well um, for the simple fact that you may end up with a PV system that's bigger than what your roof can support. So you want to th think about using those last two options there. And even the first option, you want to make sure you know what you're doing on that one as well. So, okay. The other thing we had discussed earlier, PV exceptions. Okay, so down here, there's that effective solar access less than 80 square feet. I don't need a solar system under that scenario. There's some additional choices down here. Those are all the exceptions that Gina showed on the prior slide. And Gina and I both know that there are some more exceptions that will be coming uh, in an updated release. So keep an eye on that as well. Okay, so the battery. Sorry. Oop, that's okay. <laughs> yep. it's okay. That was me. It's two drivers. I got a backseat driver here. Two drivers. <laughs> okay, um, the battery. Now, you can specify how the battery is controlled. I honestly don't think you should be doing this. Okay, I think you should be leaving it at basic. Um, basic means, yeah, it's just a battery and it does what it does. Okay, it takes care of the house when it needs it. Time of use. Okay, now we are scheduling the battery so that it will actually uh, decide when is the best time to charge, when is the best time to discharge, based around time of use charges and things like that. You may not have a battery that smart. I don't know. And advanced DR control. Okay, so this one is totally George Jetson stuff. Uh, the battery is <laughs> going to be controlled by the utility. They're going to send out signals saying, hey, give us back some energy here and start bleeding your battery back into the grid to take care of their peak loads. So, yeah, that's a future, future thing that may come around someday, but I, I wouldn't count on that being there right now. So you may disagree with me on that. So be it. Uh, but let me know when you find, find a situation where the utility can control your battery from behind the meter. So okay. Kim is asking, does the time of use make sense if you know the owner is going to be using that type of rate structure? That's between you and your client. I personally am still going to keep it at basic because I don't want to rerun the calculation when they end up connecting everything and that time of use rate schedule might not be available to that building owner yet. It's all up to the utility. So it depends on how comfortable you are on taking chances with what that actual install is going to look like out in the field. I agree with you 100% on that. Absolutely. I, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's very sketchy stuff as far as right now goes for making these predictions. Okay, we're going to walk through where we see this stuff on the CF1R. Kim had asked if I have using standard PV size. I have plenty of roof area. Do I still need the solar contractor? Yes. Have you confirmed that you have enough sunlight on the property of where this roof is going to be? And that's typically when that PV contractor is going to be coming in and helping determine site location, um, solar access, and how best and where that and how big. That, yes, you need to have someone involved who okay. can really help the design. Here's a good observation. Okay, Kim, you tell them they need uh, 3KW of solar. Okay, so they proceed ahead. They put the 3KW in. Uh, the owner pulls up with their two electric cars, pulls them into the garage, and suddenly finds, oh, you know, we should have sized that solar a little bigger to take care of our electric vehicles. Now, the solar contractor would have told them that. Okay, so that's probably not, a, not the sort of thing you would even think about. Oh, yeah, you know, we've got 26 fountains sprinkled around our property. And uh, we definitely want to be able to take care of the fountains. Oh, what about that swimming pool? I got an Olympic-sized swimming pool in my backyard. 
et cetera, et cetera. So you, you see there's a lot of other things that come into play. So mm -hmm. it, it's better to have them involved to help guide the, the homeowner on what is the appropriate size. You're just telling him what's needed, the minimum size needed to meet code compliance. And make sure you have that written clearly in your proposal documents with your client, what you're doing and what you're not doing. <laughs> OK, let's look at the CF1R. So I'm highlighting here project scope, um, because the minute it's new construction, the minute now I'm an EDR score, and the minute PV is going to be something that's looked at for the project. So if you have addition, then I'm not going to see an EDR score. If you have an existing plus alteration and or addition, you're not going to see an EDR score. So this is really important. Software version keeping up on using the latest and greatest version of software and being aware you get to use whatever that version of software you used when you submitted for permit, just in case we do have changes in software versions. And now that we have some new language that's within the CF1R that's um, uh, supporting ADUs when they're an addition. Remember, if it's an ADU that's new construction, we're not going to be seeing anything here. That would be under that new conditioned floor area because of some of the issues regarding indoor air quality fan numbers. Here's our lovely EDR score. Martin, do you want to walk them through what we're seeing here in this EDR score? Absolutely. Um, have my arrow back? <laughs> I'm giving you your arrow. <laughs> OK. All right. So take a look here. There's two scores we need to comply with, what I call the efficiency score and I call the total score. We can see what they look like for the standard design as well as what we are proposing. So we can see here that our efficiency score is in compliance. Our total score is in compliance. We have suitable margins here that are zero to positive, and therefore we are in compliance. So pay attention to both sets of scores there. Both need to comply. And also, let's take a look at the photovoltaics here. Now, there's a confusing uh, item up here. The standard design PV capacity is 2.8 kW. That doesn't mean anything, OK? That doesn't mean anything. 2.8 kW is what's used in the budget building. We don't care. We really don't. That's what was used in the budget. What we care about is this is what I'm proposing to put in. It's a 5.36 kW system. And uh, I specified here that it's uh, a roof mount system. And very important here, in this example, I specified CFI, Hellflex install. What that means is I have no clue how they're going to install this PV system. Is it going to be on the south roof, on the east roof, the west roof, or a combination thereof? And so therefore, I simply say CFI and the contractor can install it anywhere they want as long as it's somewhere between facing east, south, and west. So that's an actually a pretty important one to think about when you guys are doing the PV uh, inputs into Energy Pro. And Gina did allude to the fact that there'll be a second flavor of uh, CFI uh, coming up in some future updates. But let's not worry too much about that. We'll get too lost in the weeds. For all of us who want to design, well, not design, for all of us who want to put into the CF1R a baseline PV system that must be taken over by others, you're going to do that standard PV size, and you're going to do CFI, because that's leaving the door open for a PV contractor or designer to come and really design what makes sense to the building with it meeting that bare minimum PV. But then the discussion with the building owner is going to decide what makes the most sense to the building with their needs. Um, did you want to speak at all here, Martin, about this whole line item, about 20% over um, proposed, so you might violate NEM rules? No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. So um, as Josh has alluded to, I think, in his uh, write-ups in the chat, there's something called NEM, net energy metering. So this uh, project here, as you can see, is producing way more electricity than it needs, 20% more. You run the risk, in this case, of violating the rules that the utility has which says, you know, we don't want you to be a power producer. We want you to produce the electricity that you need and maybe have a little bit more to, more to spare, OK? So if you're starting to produce large amounts of uh, energy, they're going to say to you, no, you can't have your, your net energy metering uh, meter. And so that's going to create problems when you go to get your final meter. 
So you definitely want to, quote, contact the local utility. Do not contact the <laughs> Energy Commission. Do not contact EnergySoft. Don't contact Gina. Okay, if you're oversizing that system, then you better have the, your solar installer involved and saying to you, yeah, let's go ahead and proceed with that. Yeah, I would not proceed with this at all unless I have a, a solar contractor involved. Let's walk through battery and some of these special features that we're seeing here, Martin. Okay, same thing, same discussion. I think if you're going to get go down the battery path, that you need to have somebody involved that knows batteries. Now you may say, yeah, I know all about batteries, but really, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things going on here. Um, where's it going to be located? Uh, you know, things like that. Uh, what's it going to cost? What's the availability? Hey, I hear batteries are pretty popular these days, and it's getting hard to get your hands on the darn mm -hmm. things. So, yeah, you can get one if you get a new electric car, but can you get one for your house? So the important stuff that There's we've There's also got, a whole new slew of building code requirements regarding battery install in this 2019 building code cycle. So there's a lot to know, really honestly, like Martin was saying, about the install requirements of these batteries. Absolutely. Because, you know, when it comes right down to it, these are fairly volatile batteries. You hit them with your car or something, you don't want to start a fire. Um, the capacity of the battery, the kilowatt hours, is uh, probably the main consideration we have here. But as Gina points out, different batteries have different rates of charge and discharge. And so you'll see the efficiency of the batteries are given. Uh, one is the charge rate, uh, one is the discharge, uh, or charge efficiency, and one is the discharge efficiency. And, you know, batteries aren't perfect. You put, uh, these are uh, optimistic numbers we've got here. I think you were saying more, more like, what, 90%, Gina? Yeah, 95 is promising something a little on, on the higher end that is readily available. The lower end is 90. So 90 would be a safer number to use. Yep, I hear you. Um, so it's up to you if you guys want to put a battery into your analysis. I highly recommend, though, you have the the company that's going to be involved in that uh, give the recommendation as to what the homeowner needs. You can certainly run the numbers and say, hey, you know, I ran a, a 6kWh and I ran an 8kWh, and in both cases I'm in compliance. So you guys decide which one. You Let's talk a little bit about why someone would choose to incorporate battery into their energy model. And it could be because you have a homeowner who's all about it. But I got to tell you, a lot of times it's because we're trying to give them flexibility on their building efficiency number. If my battery is at least 5 kWh or greater, I can take a self-utilization credit and use that battery storage, which is now extra credit. This is this only because I'm choosing to do this and offset penalties that may be associated with too much glass, with not wanting to use a high-performance wall. That's where we're going to, I think, most often have these conversations about why are we even talking about battery. It's because they want some more flexibility with their building design. And that's already we have a couple projects that this is part of the conversation. How about you, Martin? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that um, <laughs> you and I think have discussed this is you know not putting a battery in um, and getting compliance is an interesting solution for when you've got QII, right? So we got QII in there. The installing contractor doesn't have the QII verification done. They bring it back to Gina and say, Gina, what are you going to do now to get this into compliance? They didn't do QII. That's the point at which you can say, let's do a battery and claim the uh, self-utilization credit. Right. They did. The Energy Commission made sure the battery credit at 5 kWh was equal to the QII TDV energy savings and also any additional more aggressive U-factor requirements for walls and high-performance wa uh, roofs. So that's what that TDV equivalency is. So it's really based on the design of the home, where the home is, and what how is that design matching up to prescriptive? It's, you really have to understand prescriptive baseline. Let's do a check your understanding now that we've gone through PV and battery and see how you guys are feeling about this. 
So I'm giving you a little snapshot of that overview of structure for Energy Pro, and you can use that to answer the first question at the project level, which tab are you going to use to model PV systems? Where are you going to input that KW? Which exception available here on this list supports no PV required? Man, there's some people like flying through these, check your understandings. An EDR score is applicable to which type of project? So Martin, at the project level, which tab am I going to use to model PV? Well, the one that's marked PV plus battery. I love it when it's, it's self-evident, but you know, it isn't always. So I get it when people don't automatically assume that's the tab because, you know, <laughs> sometimes I sit there and go, why did they make that really hard to find? <laughs> Which exception supports no PV required? So exception one, where you've got a substantially shaded site, uh, will allow you to get by with no PV. If you can show with solar studies or other types of tools that must be approved by the Energy Commission, hopefully they'll be approved soon, <laughs> um, you have to substantiate, I don't have at least 80 square feet of roof area that um, is not completely shaded for design, for things outside the control of the design, such as trees, such as topography, such as other buildings that are already surrounding where this building is going to be. It cannot be because, you're model, because they're designing a north-facing roof. Um, so it's outside the design parameters of the home that we take this solar shading into consideration. An EDR score is applicable to which type of project, Martin? OK, this is only applicable to new construction projects. So if you're doing any type of addition, any type of alteration, you're not going to have an EDR score. And it also means you're not going to see any contribution from photovoltaics. It's only contributing on new construction projects. Excellent, everyone. Let's go back to our presentation and start diving into envelope. I have to tell you that there aren't a lot of changes associated with the envelope, but Martin and I wanted to talk through some of the nuances of how you use Energy Pro that we get a lot of questions on. So let's talk about the code updates. High performance addicts. High performance addicts apply to climate zones 4 and 8 through 16. In the 2016 code, we had three options, above roof deck insulation plus ceiling insulation, below roof deck insulation plus ceiling insulation, um, radiant barrier with all the ducts in the conditioned space, of which means I only need one layer of insulation. What they did is they removed the prescriptive option for the above roof deck. You would have to use the performance approach and take a penalty for doing an above roof deck insulation plus ceiling insulation. It's also important for you to understand that you're being compared to option B. In climate zones 4 and 8 through 16, you're being compared to an attic that's ventilated, has insulation below the roof deck, and insulation at the ceiling. So if you have a cathedral ceiling or a non-vented roof, you're taking a pretty big penalty for not having a high-performance attic. And I find that that is something that a lot of people are just not understanding when they see their big building efficiency numbers not matching up the way they want them to. Hey, Gina. Insulation. That yeah? High that high-performance attic, I hear a lot of people are treating that as uh, a conditioned space. What do you think about that? So how the energy code speaks to conditioned addicts, it has to be directly conditioned. And for it to be directly conditioned, that means there's actually a heating and cooling register in that attic. Now you get to call it a conditioned attic. Just because you have an unvented attic and you're completely insulating um, below the roof deck, that is not a conditioned attic. That's an indirectly conditioned attic and does not get you out of these requirements at all. Is that what you were trying to go for, Martin? Yeah, and in the software, we call it uh, unventilated attic, which is pretty obvious. Um, and yeah, I, I think everybody needs to know the distinction there because I was talking to somebody the other day that says they're doing the ventilated high performance attic and calling it conditioned space. It's like, well, it's a ventilated space. That's not, 
it's not a condition space. So, thank you. Kim is asking, what is Climate Zone 3 compared to? So those Climate Zones we did not mention would be compared to just ceiling insulation based on the prescriptive requirements of your Climate Zone. And I think Climate Zone 3 is R38, but I don't have it memorized. I would have to look it up. Let's talk about walls. Mandatory minimum, there's a new mandatory minimum in town, and this is catching a lot of people by surprise. Two by six walls now, you're not allowed ever, if it's a new wall, to use R19. You have to use R20. Martin, which, what can I use that gets me an R20? Okay, uh, there's a, many different ways you can fill that cavity. You go in there with spray foam to get yourself to R20. Probably the most common thing to go in there with would be an R21 bat. It's a uh, bat that's been around in that industry for quite a lot of years. Uh, you certainly do have blown-in situations, not like the, the spray foam, but rather the blown-in um, cellulose as well. So there's a number of ways to get there, but R19 is not designed to fit into that space. And the problem with R19 is it compresses down to R17.8, so you don't even get a really an R19 wall. What you are compared to prescriptively is dependent upon climate zone. Climate zone 6 and 7, they haven't had any changes here in a while. In fact, I find these two climate zones are so extremely mild that it's really hard to try and get design consideration choices that you can balance because there's just not a lot of energy used to trade. All the other climate zones, the U factor has been reduced from a 0 0.051 down to a 0 0.048. Yeah, it's not a huge change, but it means it makes trading away a high-performance wall. That means I have two layers of insulation associated with my wall. It's harder to trade away. Multifamily, they did not change the U-factor requirements, so this lower U-factor that we're talking about is only associated with climate zones of single family, not including climate zones 6 and 7. Mass walls, whether it's below grade or above grade, now have new mandatory insulation requirements that match up exactly with what the prescriptive requirements used to look like in the last code cycle. Gina has issues. Hmm. U-factor for windows <laughs> has been reduced from a 0.32 to a 0.30 in all climate zones. So if you're trying to use, let's say, metal windows, this just made that a lot harder because what you're being compared to is more aggressive. In climate zones in which you have an SHGC requirement, that does not include climate zones 1, 3, 5, and for the very first time, climate zone 16. The SHGC requirement dropped from a 0.25 to a 0.23. What do people need to be aware of, especially in using the performance approach in those climate zones that do not have an SHGC requirement, Martin? Well, the purpose of not having an SHGC requirement is to encourage a higher level of solar gain into the home, something we used to call passive home design. And uh, that higher level of solar gain offsets the need for heating. So if you go in there with low SHGC windows, you will take a penalty in the performance approach for doing that. So ironically, you could still do shift of compliance because it doesn't says you can do anything you want, but the performance approach is going to show a uh, an increase in heating. So. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to let you take doors because I know you love them. Yeah, you, you can do the doors. Okay. Um, in, <laughs> the, in the 2019 code, they would like, this is a prescriptive requirement, so I say like, not require. They would like you to put in an NFRC, National Fenestration Rating Council, uh, door that has basically an R5. Now, I see two issues with this. Uh, number one, I've really never run across an NFRC rated door. Uh, number two, they do want it insulated to an R5, so that means it's going to be a phone door. So what is this going to mean when you specify this in your Title 24 report as far as the homeowner goes? Well, first off, the architect comes into my office and says, here's, here's a set of plans, Martin, and uh, we're doing a front door. Okay, what sort of door are you doing? I don't know, we're doing a door. A homeowner will pick that out when they go down to the door store partway through and work it out with a contract. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'm going to have you guys do an R5 door, you, NFRC rated. They go down to the door store. They say, oh, my gosh, that's the ugliest door ever. You mean I have to put that on the front door of my house? So, <laughs> so guess what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to put it into my Title 24 calcs until I get some assurance 
that that's the door the homeowner is going to want to do. So the other thing we need to be aware of is that if the door is 25% or more glass, we treat the whole thing as a window. So and these are now, as you say that out, again, yeah. the whole thing as a window. I don't care. You only have 15 square feet of glass. You're treating the entire 21 square foot opening as glass. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know the the thing about uh, some of these things, as you pointed out, Gina, is that it makes can make the difference between a project that complies and a project that doesn't comply because it shifts it, uh, you know, around on that EDR boundary. So it's something you guys are going to have to think about how you want to handle this. I have had about four projects on my desk in the last couple of months where the difference between compliance or not was an NFRC solid front door. And I mean, that just really amazed me. I did not think I would see that nuance. HERS measures regarding envelope, QII is no longer a performance credit only if I want to. It's something I can use. Kind of like how I'm thinking about battery right now. It's a last ditch effort. There's a lot associated with it. It's going to be kind of expensive. Guess what? That is now prescriptively required for new homes and additions exceeding 700 square feet. So it means when you hit that calculate button, you are compared to a building that is going through the QII inspection process and will pass successfully out in the field. This is going to be a big change for us. Let's talk about modeling and how we're going to go about all of this. Let's talk with our assemblies first. And I really wanted Martin to talk to us about when are we ever going to use the JA4 tab for our opaque assemblies versus the residential Title 24 performance tab. Okay, as it states in that little blurb to the right there, this tab is used to edit the attributes of the assembly used solely for prescriptive calculations. So if you're not doing prescriptive compliance here, you do not need to worry about what is in this tab. What you would worry about is what we have in the Res T24 Performance tab. And you'll see here we're putting in information such as the cavity. Now people say to me, Martin, I'm doing a... Um, a blown in or not a blown in a spray foam insulation how do I model that what's the R value it's uh, 26 all right but the cavity is 26 oh wait I'm gonna do a bad insulation okay put in whatever the R value is I'm doing XYZ insulation tell me the R value that's all we care about what is the R value we don't really care what you're putting in as far as a specific product that's between you and the contractor so it's not it's not as complicated as it sounds. It's like just tell me the R value. We have uh, the framing costs, which uh, impacts things. Here's an example where we have exterior continuous rigid insulation. So what we have here is an R4. Here's an example where we have no interior insulation. I've never heard of it being done on a on a wall, but you could put the foam board on the inside. Now, there are certain choices for the exterior wall finish. There's three of them there. You say to me, Martin, I want to see metal siding on there. It's not on there. Okay? Until the Energy Commission adds metal siding into their database of acceptable exterior wall finishes, the software has the three choices. Use the choice which you think is most appropriate. Don't contact us and say, well, you guys need to add a third choice or fourth choice. We've already put that on the request list, and the Energy Commission has made it very clear that that is a low-priority item for them, which is fine. I see a lot more important things being that they're doing, so I agree with you. Same here. I'd rather they spend their time and energy on some other things first. <laughs> I heat pump water heaters for um, central multifamily. Okay. Um, also, non-standard spray foam insulation. What we're basically saying here is that you're not using the default values for spray foam which I believe somebody corrected me on this morning. I believe it's R3.6 for open closed cell, R5.8 for closed cell. I think that's you, you guys that's have correct. To it. Yeah, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this means I'm <clears throat> going to use an actual manufacturer rated value for their specific spray foam product. This requires the HERS rater needs to come out and verify that circumstance. So that one's up to you. 
We use that one a lot more often these days, especially when QII is involved on the project, because the HERS raters out there anyway already looking at the insulation, and I can get some better U factors associated with my assemblies to make my compliance look better. Let's look at the room level. Here we are. We're putting in exactly what the wall is, but I really wanted Martin to walk us through how we engage this wall exception that's associated with additions. Okay, so the Energy Commission gives us a, a reduced requirement for this circumstance. First off, we need to identify uh, at the project level uh, what type of project we're doing. It's not going to be activated for new construction projects. It would be activated for additions, or it would be act activated also for addition plus alteration. The second thing we need to do, we need to identify at the zone that this is, in fact, the new space associated with the building. Okay, this is the addition, in other words. So that's selected as new. Next thing we need to do, we need to ensure that we have a construction assembly here, which is at least R15. And that's what the footnote down there says, R15 or above. Otherwise, this input will be grayed out. But if it's not grayed out, then you can claim credit that this is either an extension to the wall or it is an existing wall in which we have the siding remaining. So this really can make the difference, especially with these small ADUs that our ADUs are converted or added on from existing space. It really makes a difference. Fenestration, uh, there's not anything new here at all. Just being aware of the fact that you're really going to have to be cognizant that you're using NFRC rated values here within your calculation so that things are going to work properly. Where I wanted Martin to spend a little bit of time is now inputting those windows in the walls and how we could take advantage of shading. Okay, so anytime you're selecting windows, you do have the option to add things like overhangs to them. And the standard building doesn't have any overhangs. So in a cooling climate, an overhang is going to be basically credit. When you describe the overhang for me, I need two things about the window. You need to tell me the width of the window and the height of the window. And that's so we can calculate the total geometry associated with the overhang. Don't worry about. I these thought this was only for non-res. Well, no. Martin, do we have to do width and height even for residential? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we 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 definitely need the geometry of the windows. It's these other two down here. Okay. The positioning on the wall. See, see over here, X and Y positions only required for the NRT24. So that's the only time we need that. Here and we go. Because, Gina was wrong on her on her. Color coding, that will be updated in the handout. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Yep. Yep. OK. Now let's talk about um, assemblies. And what I wanted to be able to show you here is how we go about importing assemblies. And this is going to be pretty valuable when we're talking about these doors. So here I am in my JA4 assembly. And the best thing you should always be doing for your JA4 tab is importing. So I'm going to import a door, and this is what shows up. Martin, walk us through the two inputs that matter to us the most for our conditioned envelope doors and what we're going to use for NFRC. Okay. So there's two scenarios you would consider here. One is you're putting in a conventional wood door. It's not NFRC rated. I like that approach because I now have the flexibility to tell the homeowner, go pick out that intro carved uh, mahogany door that you're interested in. They're not going to come back to me and say, what did you make me do here? Uh, uh, down here, you have the NFRC choice, which is the R5 door. So just keep in mind that if you want to make that choice, you are dictating what the choices will be when they go to actually select their doors. And I strongly suggest naming this assembly NFRC so that everyone is aware of what's going on. Here Martin was talking about HERS verifications that apply to the whole building, such as QII. And QII is something that we've always taught people only use this when the entire design and construction team are up to speed on what's going on with QII. But now the issue is if you don't check this box, you're taking a penalty for not having QII if it's a new home or a new ADU freestanding on the property. 
I think uh, envelope leakage testing might be used a little bit more often, and I have more of a tendency to use it if I am using that closed cell spray insulation that's going to be verified by that HERS rater that's going to really help me pass QII. I might really be engaging that more often. We definitely use these HERS verified existing conditions that are being altered. This only applies to an alteration project. Martin, tell them what happens under the hood when I engage HERS verified conditions and how I engage a HERS rater. Okay, so what you're going to do is obviously indicate which particular item you want to have verified. Nobody says you have to have everything verified. So as an example, I've got existing single pane aluminum windows. I want to get credit for the fact that we're tearing those out and we're going to put in some nice high performance uh, vinyl low E windows. So we don't believe you that you have existing single pane aluminum windows. What's the chances of that? We need you to send a HERS rater out and verify that existing condition. The HERS rater goes out and says, yeah, we found aluminum frame single pane windows, believe it or not, and so we can now take credit for that as an upgrade. But if you don't have that verified, then you are out of luck. We're going to treat it as though you have existing double pane low E vinyl windows. I say we. That's it can the, really make in, in, <laughs> <laughs> it, it can make really make a difference in providing flexibility and design features for an existing plus alteration. Let's look at where we're going to see these features in our CF1R. This table hopefully is not looking new to anyone out there. This table has not changed at all in giving us what are those NFRC rated U factors, SHGC numbers, etc. Opaque doors. As you notice, it's not at all telling me I have an NFRC door here because I didn't name it an NFRC door. The only way I know this is because in this column 4 over here, it has a U factor of 0.2. So help your plans examiners understand what's going on. Here's where there's been some nice changes with the form. Martin, why are we excited about this? Okay, so let's take a look at as an example the R21 wall line item there. And what we've indicated here is it's an exterior wall. It's wood framed, 2 by 6, 16 inch on center, all normal stuff. It's got R21 in the cavity. But we've also indicated with a new column 6 here that's been added by the Energy Commission that is designated as having R5 exterior continuous insulation. This saves us the headache of digging over here into column 8 and digging that information out, I can hand this to a, a contractor and say there's your specifications for the insulation in columns 5 and 6. Great improvement. So excited about this. I'm so glad the Energy Commission it took the time to get this to work. Here we are where we have our HERS verifications as it just applies to envelope. We're saying yes, we're doing QII. We're not going to have the HERS rater verify any spray insulation R values. We're saying yes to uh, envelope leakage, and you'll see that in column four, there's a specific number. And that's the number that must be met or better when that HERS rater does the blower door test to verify infiltration. So it can be a little scary if you're not really up to speed on what that number should be. And hey, Martin, I'm going to put this arrow right up here in the upper left-hand corner so that we have access to it easily as we move through this. Perfect. HVAC. We have new MRF 13 filter requirements for all new systems. That's new ducting and new units, what would apply to new, um, H to new dwelling units. It also is going to apply when I have all new ducting and I'm keeping the existing equipment, and when I have all new ducting and I'm replacing the existing equipment. And this is not even something we model at all. But it's just so important that we want to make sure everyone is making sure to share this, especially with our HVAC contractors. Martin and I are saying it as often as we can. The ventilation requirements for new homes and for additions over 1,000 square feet and for any new dwelling unit, I don't care how big it is, these numbers have pretty much doubled. So you should be definitely be looking for what those numbers are and make sure that you're coordinating with who is specifying the local exhaust ventilation fan systems to make sure that they are um, in place. A HERS rater, this is, is part of what's new for this next code cycle, 
a HERS rater is going to go out and verify not only that MERV-13 filter, in addition to verifying the ventilation rate is being maintained. That is something that they were also doing under the 2016 code cycle. We're going to spend a little bit of time on multifamily indoor air quality ventilation right now. There are three different methods to do indoor air quality ventilation for all buildings. This is not just for multifamily. I can do exhaust only. I'm going to use a local exhaust fan that has to be there anyway. Let's say the bathroom fan. I'm going to size it appropriately for indoor air quality and make sure that it's always on as a continuous fan system because I don't want to put any fancy controls. That's not the best indoor air quality ventilation system because now it's pooling that beautiful fresh air from all the nooks and crannies in the building that we have no control over. Supply ventilation is when I'm using a fan to push air into the space. Again, I'm not loving that either because especially when some of my local fans turn on, things are going all over the place. And especially in a multifamily environment, I may be pushing my very icky air because I smoke and or I'm smoking pot and all my neighbors get to deal with it too. Balanced ventilation is what the Energy Commission is really wanting people to design into their multifamily buildings in which there's equal supply CFM being pushed into a space with a continuous fan system as there is being exhausted through a continuous fan system. What happens when you don't use a balanced ventilation system for this 2019 code cycle, what's going to happen, Martin? Well, it means the HERS rater is going to come out and not only do the testing of the ventilation system, but they're also going to have to do blower door tests. And number one, there's an expense associated with blower door tests. Number two, there's a risk associated with the blower door test. What if it fails? So as it starts to fail, they're going to be having to do more blower door tests. If you had a 200-unit apartment building, I'm not sure what the cost of blower door tests would be once you hit 200 dwelling units, but I sure as heck would be concerned about what the cost is going to be to go back and fix 200 dwelling units that are leaky because nobody bothered to seal the plates penetrations uh, where the electrical contractor came through, where the plumbing contractor came through, where the condenser lines are all going through. So that could turn out to be a pretty disastrous thing. And I know what you said, Gina. Uh, OK, at that point, they go ahead and just put in a uh, balanced ventilation system. Well, now you're talking about cutting holes in the side of the building for your balanced ventilation systems. That's another 400 holes that you're going to be putting in the side of the building. That's 400 ceilings or 200 ceilings you're going to be pulling out to get access to put that in. You'll need to run electrical to it. That's going to be a pretty disastrous It's expensive. Yeah. And I can't show I have 10 feet between my outlet and any other, you know, outdoor air intake into the space. Well, ah. and you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna have to provide filtration, the MERV-13 filter on that, uh, that yeah. system. And you're going have to have to have access to the MERV-13 filters in each of those circumstances. You're talking huge, 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 huge. So. Has to be designed in, can't be an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Kitchen hoods, uh, kitchen hoods now need to have a minimum ventilation rate per ASHRAE 62.2. That's the 26 version of ASHRAE 62.2, and also be quiet three zones or less, as is certified through the HVI directory. Potentially, there might be another directory that's approved in addition to HVI. We'll see a blueprint come out on that soon regarding whether that's in play or not. And a HERS rater is going to go out and verify that kitchen hood is actually certified through HBI or this future um, other organization. When we talk about our split uh, DX and um, our package, very rare for residential, if we're using a gas furnace, we have a new fan efficacy requirement of 0.45 watts per CFM. And this is because there are new um, efficacy requirements by the federal government for gas furnaces. And because of that, it makes it viable for a test to get as low as 0.45 watts per CFM if the contractor is aware of how they need to size their return grills and so forth to make this possible. I'm so nervous about this one. If it's anything other than a gas furnace, well, then it's going to be the same fan efficacy we had before, which is the 0.5, 0 0.58 watts per CFM. Whew, this one, I'm so happy. I'm so excited. Martin, what's coming with the next version of software? So a lot of people have been complaining uh, for about six years now 
that we don't get any credit for mini splits and uh, VRF type systems. In fact, we get a penalty in the software. So what's happening is the Energy Commission has done a study and they are going to implement in the next versions an actual credit for the installation of what they call a VCHP, Variable Capacity Heat Pump. Most of us call those mini splits and uh, VRF systems. But what you got to keep in mind is you will get a substantial credit, but there are specific installation criteria that will have to be met. And you'll see that on this slide. And one of those things is that they do want uh, a unit installed, an indoor unit installed in each habitable space. So you'll have to make sure you meet that criteria. That exceeds 150 square feet. Oh, thank you. It exceeds 150. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. So that's something you just got to be aware of. And uh, the great news is you'll get substantial credit in the next version of the software for that. You get um, a little bit of credit on the efficiency. Is I'm going to take us back to this last slide. You get 5% uh, for your cooling efficiency, 12% for your heating efficiency. Got to tell you, the manufacturers were not happy with that. But what we really get is we get to say, yes, the ducts are completely in the conditioned space, because gosh dang it, either I don't have any ducts, or yes, they really are in the conditioned space. And in the 2016 software, that was not something we could manipulate at all. In the 2019 software, when we're able to do this, that's going to be automatic, and that's where most of our energy savings is really going to show up in our um, calculations. It will have to be verified by a HERS rater, along with the duct leakage. There's nothing new there happening. Here with our mechanical systems, we see that kitchen hood, the air filter device. These are um, new HERS verification ventilation requirements, and the very bottom here it's in yellow because it's not fully engaged yet when those variable capacity heat pump system options as part of the next software, it will also automatically trigger that a HERS rater is going to go out and verify it if you want to take credit for those systems. Let's talk about modeling. So let's start with our assemblies. So we have our um, Standard systems, I'm sorry, there's nothing really new here in terms of what we're modeling on the heating side. Is there anything you want to point out here, Martin? No, other than people get a little bit confused about mini splits. Uh, you know, a mini split is a split DX system. It's just a miniaturized version of the outdoor unit. Nothing special about that. Um, and then we have what we have in terms of our heating type. Um, electric resistance is still, yes, going to be extremely difficult. And I don't know about you, Martin, but I keep getting homeowners coming to me going, I'm saving the planet, and I'm putting a PV system on my building. So now I want to change all my heat pump equipment to electric resistance because I can use as much electricity as I want now. Is that true? No, not at all. In fact, I had a great example of this where um, the homeowner was wanting to put an ADU in, and the utility came out and said, we're going to charge you $80,000 to put a gas meter in. And the guy said, well, you're better off just putting an electric resistance heating in and uh, calling it a day. And it's like, eh, don't take your uh, Title 24 advice from your local utility. <laughs> no, you need to put a heat pump yeah. in. I talked to the homeowner. He goes, yeah, I was wondering about that. I said, yeah, no, it needs to get heat pump. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get all sorts of advice about that, but it hasn't changed. Our inputs for our furnace type have not changed at all either. Let's move over to what's going on with cooling. Oops, I went too fast. Nothing new happening here um, except for the fact that, um, you know, some of these efficiencies might look a little bit different in our next version of software, taking into consideration the new rules. Um, our intermittent fan control is what we're going to be using for our HVAC systems. And pretty much all the other tabs here are all about non-res or non-compliance options. But I do want to talk about what's going on here at the project level. Martin, can you talk about kitchen hoods and also the ventilation, cooling, and indoor air quality inputs here on the screen? Absolutely. So you get to tell us whether or not your project has kitchen hoods involved. It's a very simple checkbox. You either do or you don't. It's not going to change the calculations one iota but it will put the message on the report that the HERS rater needs to come out and verify the kitchen hoods. Mandatory measure, so just uh, deal with it. That's the way it is. So um, over here, you can specify your ventilation cooling system. That's the term the Energy Commission likes to use. The rest of us call it a whole house fan. OK. 
Okay, you would activate a whole house fan here, and we'll show you later on where you put it in the other part of the building tree. The other thing that's become very popular is people like to specify a specific IAQ fan. All right, if you know what you're doing, great. Go ahead and put your IAQ fan specification in, particularly if you want to do a balanced system, like Gina talked about in multifamily, or you want to do an ERV or HRV. You'll need to check that box, and then we'll go to the Zone Dwelling tab to put the information in there. So a lot of things there, they're going to open up things, they're going to show up later on. Here under our system level, you can be grabbing your system like you always have. There's nothing new there. In the distribution, there's nothing new here. I do think here there's verified duct design. Um, I'm going to be potentially using this a lot more often. I'm going to be offering duct design services at my company because I think this is one of those last big tools we have in our tool belt we can use to have some design flexibility. But there's one thing, they have made it where there's no way you can input one linear feet of ducting. Why does that drive us absolutely crazy, Martin? Well, let's, let's be careful here because if you check this box, that means you know the exact linear footage and diameter of every piece of duct in that house. And there's not too many of us on the call here that are going to be able to say, I've got a set of plans that shows me that. So don't be checking that box if you don't know that information. And if you do know that information, we all know it's not one foot. <laughs> mm -hmm. So It's never going to be one foot. Use carefully, and you need to understand that the Hertz Raider has to come out and check that. And if the Hertz Raider doesn't find the duct specifications you put in, then it's coming back for recalc. Okay, now we're going to talk about the residential tab. Here's because we said we had ventilation cooling. We're seeing the ability to put inputs in for that whole house fan, um, overall CFM value. I have a lot of people saying, oh, is this my whole house indoor air quality fan? No. Would you ever want to be using 1,500 CFM on all the time, 24 hours a day? No, 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 no. This is on because the <laughs> – what, you do it? You can get that to work? No, 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 no. no. I've seen people try to do it for their IAQ fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the occasional fan turned on because I'm flushing out the attic in the home. Here we have things about wood heat. And what I also wanted to be able to show you guys is some of our new inputs. Martin, walk us through our new inputs we're going to see in the next version of software, not 8.04, 8.05. Variable capacity heat pump designation there. You will now get the credit we just alluded to. You can give us the option that it has an automatic fan. It's pretty common where the fan just comes on and off as it needs uh, to for the purposes of uh, heating and cooling the space, and whether or not it has duct. So very simple inputs there to get you to that 20% credit that you alluded to. Okay, now let's talk about the zone level. So here at the zone level, the general tab, nothing really new there going on. We already talked about picking your um, your occupancy. Martin, talk them through what we're seeing in the dwelling unit tab that's important. Okay. So number one, you do get the option here to specify your ventilation system, your IAQ fan in other words. So this is giving us information in this example that it's a balanced system. So maybe Gina was doing a multifamily project and didn't want to do that onerous uh, lower door testing for each dwelling unit. You specify the airflow, the wattage of the unit, and optionally whether or not it has a heat recovery capability, sometimes referred to in the industry as an HRV or an ERV. So that's something, if you're going to put that specification in, make sure everybody's on board with what that specification is going to be. Okay. In addition, and also be aware of the, the uh, credits that were available for a balanced heat recovery system has been ramped down tremendously because it's not letting you oversize the airflow. So I am already got a lot of people saying, I used to get a lot of credit when I did this, and now it's not that much at all. Right, because they changed the rules behind that because we don't want to oversize these systems in terms of, in terms of how they're being used. These are fans that are always going to be on. So be aware, it's not the magic bullet it was in the 2016 software. Sorry, Martin. 
No, that's fine. And in the initial release of the 2019, <laughs> they, got, they got wise to that. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, when you're doing uh, all electric homes, how do you specify this? Well, you can specify here that your range is electric, and you can specify that your dryer is electric. Obviously, the specification of your heating system, a.k.a. your heat pump, would indicate it's electric. And then you'll do the same specification for your domestic hot water heater, which is what we're going to talk about in the next section. Okay. Let's look at what that's going to look like on the CF1R. Here we have our heat pump information, and I just really want to make sure that everyone is aware of the fact with heat pump we are putting in a heating capacity at 47 degrees Fahrenheit and at 17 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're going to guess on the 17 degrees Fahrenheit, be very conservative and understand what a conservative number is. The lower the number, the more conservative it is. You need to be understanding what is the AHRI 17 degree heat output at these cold temperatures that will affect your compliance margins. Because it's all about when it's super, super cold out, how much electric strip heating might have to be used to maintain a temperature. We have then also here our HERS verifications associated with our mechanical equipment. You'll see there's just a couple more inputs, HERS verification, than we saw before. Here's what it is just for um, our, our distribution. I totally plan on using this verified duct design a little bit more, but I am going to make sure there is a duct design included with the plan set to back it up. <laughs> and uh, here we have that efficiency. Martin, this is an example of having a, oh, this is an example of a heat pump system with the fan efficacy at 0.58. If this was a gas system, it would be 0.45. And we had a question earlier on, do I have to make sure to change that in Energy Pro? And the answer is yes, you do. Yeah, make sure you look at your CF1R. Yeah, you don't want us assuming it's going to be a 0.45. You put in a heat pump, you didn't even notice that. And then the guy goes out to test the heat pumps. We can't get that. So you really mm -hmm. don't want us assuming the lower number. Uh, it will force you to put in the lower number, though, for a gas furnace with air conditioning. And this CF1R is showing an example of an ERV or HRV. Martin, do you want to walk them through what numbers are important here? Absolutely. So you look down here in this table, and we have specified, number one, that this is a balanced system. OK? Uh, number two, we have specified here what the effectiveness is. And 60, 65 percent, that's not a bad number, okay? Uh, Gina mentioned she saw one that was 95 percent. No such thing. You're not going to hit 95 percent on, on these types of systems. So use your manufacturer specification. Obviously, you'll need to tell us the CFM, and you'll need to tell us the wattage as well in order to properly mark this. So let's now look at our whole house fan numbers. There's really nothing new here except for the CFVCS. Oh, there's too many C's and S's in here. Martin, what is that? The Central Fan Ventilation Cooling System. Okay? So uh, we mentioned whole house fans. They make whole house fans. You can go get them at your Home Depot, at Lowe's, wherever. Nobody makes a central fan ventilation system anymore. So don't make that selection in the software. It's not available in the marketplace. Yeah, I always like to tell people the software allows you to really make some big mistakes if you don't understand what's available out there in the industry. You still have to know this equipment. Let's do a check your understanding. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, Daryl. We're going to do a couple questions for you on mechanical. At the system level, which tab is used to document a whole house fan? And then my second question is very similar. At the building tree, where do you mull a balanced ventilation system? Select all that apply. Hint, hint, it might be in more than one place. And are you looking forward to using the mini heat pump credit we're going to be seeing in the next software update? Because I know I am.
Okay, Martin, almost everyone is saying it's the residential tab is where I'm going to model my whole house fan. Is that correct? That is correct. Excellent, everyone. And for my balanced ventilation system, all of you got, you know, this zone level. So at the zone level, I'm definitely going to be modeling the specifics of my balanced ventilation system. But Martin, where do I need to engage saying use a non-default indoor air quality ventilation system to be able to open that up? So that's at the very top level of the building tree, the project level, and that's under the residential tab. Excellent. So just be aware of that. And oh, Josh, is that you again? Now I know who said that one in the morning session because it's the same exact response about HERS Raider job security <laughs> and that Josh has been joining us for both of ours. Okay, let's go back to our presentation and start talking about what's going on with water heaters. What's been nice about the water heater situation, it's all about how the software or our compliance margins are allowing for electrification. So we always have the choice of using a gas tankless water heater at minimum federal efficiencies. If you want to use a tank water heater, well then now all of a sudden you're going to have to jump through some additional hoops. These are prescriptive additional hoops. You might be doing something different in your performance calculation because you are going to be taking a penalty for having a tank gas water heater. But we also have now the ability to do a tank heat pump water heater without penalty. So there are some climate zones, such as climate zones one and three. It's just so cold there, and heat pump technology isn't always that efficient when it gets that cold. So we have to jump through a couple of extra hoops for those super cold climate zones. And where they're really going towards is they really want people to be using um, NEA Tier 3 water heaters. Uh, Martin, walk us through what is a NEA Tier 3 and what's its availability out there. So there's an organization that rates these called uh, Northwestern Energy Efficiency Alliance, another, another uh, set of, digi set of uh, numerics there. Um, they have uh, high efficiency products which actually score really good. They score uniform energy factors in the range of three to three and a half. <clears throat> Figure the minimum default efficiency is two. So that's a significant improvement in energy efficiency. And believe it or not, you guys can put in heat pump water heaters and you will in fact get a significant amount of credit for the use of those. So highly recommended. If you're using the NEA Tier 3. NEA yeah. Tier yes. 3, nice credits on the table. Yeah, and if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I want to put a, a PV system on the roof and use that to run my electric water heater, it's like, no, no, you want to put a PV system on your roof and use it to run your electric heat pump water heater. There's a difference there. There are still huge penalties associated with electric resistance water heating. We use an awful lot of electricity to generate a BTU of heat, whereas heat pump technology uses a lot less electricity to generate that one BTU of heat. Let's talk about HERS verification measures for plumbing. We have a drain water heat recovery as a new option for HERS verification. It is a performance only if you so desire to go there. So a couple other tools in your tool belt, depending upon whether you want to go there or not. Let's talk about modeling. So in modeling, let's first talk about how we're doing our equipment in the boiler section. And here there are different types of water heaters. And Martin, can you also talk about the UEF button? Yes, absolutely. You guys pay attention to this one because they stopped using energy factor as a rating method several years ago. Federal standards require it be rated as uniform energy factor or UEF. So that means you should have that box checked <clears throat> in all circumstances when you're putting a new water heater in because you are not putting in an EF rated water heater, you're putting in a UEF rated water heater. Very important to the model. You'll act, in fact get an error message if you don't saying you must provide a UEF number. So that is an error message you will be getting. Martin, how are we grabbing these NIA Tier 3 water heaters that are so easy to get in your software? I love it, actually. Okay. <laughs> we've, got the, we've got the import button here, and we go and import from the list of heat pump water heaters. Now, this is the official list from the Energy Commission for all the NIA rated units. What's great is you'll just simply go in here and select the brand and model of your choice and then it will model that and, and there's i will say this gina there's a big difference between modeling a water heater that is near rated and one that is not 
So you will see a substantial benefit. A lot of people have observed, observed this, and that isn't the intent of the energy commission. Right. It is definitely something I'm finding people are like, wait a minute, here's a nice magic bullet I wasn't aware of. At the plant level, we have three tabs that are going to apply to our water heating systems. One is the heating hot water tab. You're only going to be using this because at your system level, you're modeling a hydronic heat pump water heater, a, a hydronic system. So here your heating coil is hot water. Then you will have to further on go and at the system level under um, your general tab, indicate where your hot water is coming from. If you say domestic hot water boiler provides heat, well, that's up over here. That's then saying you're doing a combined hydronic system, and your domestic hot water and your space heating system are using the same source. If you use heating boiler, well, then that's over here, in which you're saying there's a dedicated system just for my heating system. And what was said earlier, if you're using any type of heat pump equipment, you're not going to be allowed to do it as a combined hydronic system. And um, I also wanted to point out how we can use domestic hot water one and two. So the first one is your main unit. This is your primary hot water heating source that is feeding the hot water needs of the home. The second one can be used if you have a backup system. And this is the only time I've ever been able to get an electric resistance uh, system to work because uh, I'm, I keep forgetting I have this here. We're going to go back to this, Martin. Um, because of the fact that it is not the primary system. It is the secondary system. So if I have a secondary system, let's say, for a separate half bath in the back of the house, it being modeled as the secondary domestic hot water heating, I might be able to get it to work. It's going to be a little iffy, though. Martin, let's talk about distribution for hot water and different credits that might be available out there. So in a scenario where you've got a water heater that's going to be very close to the actual plumbing fixtures, such as an ADU, maybe you've got a, a uh, tankless water heater with the ADU and it's very close to everything, you can claim credit for compact distribution. And so there's two credits actually. One is a basic credit which does not require verification by a HERS rater. But the second one is an expanded credit, and we would have a HERS rater involved to verify those. So there's more work for Josh on that one. How about what we're seeing in terms of what needs to happen for the location of our heat pump water heaters? So you've got a number of choices here, and you should think about this carefully. Um, where you locate that heat pump water heater does have an impact on Putting it in the garage, well, the heat pump water heater is going to give off cooling. So you're basically air conditioning your garage in the end. And trust me, it really does work that way. Um, <laughs> putting it inside the home, you better think about that one because in the middle of winter, when it is 30 degrees outside and you're taking a shower, that heat pump water heater is going to run, producing hot water for you and nicely air conditioning your home in the middle of winter. So... The location outside might be a possibility, but you do want to be careful of low ambient conditions that you might see in some more extreme climate zones for that location. And you will find that the location of your heat pump water heater is going to affect your compliance. Here in our office, Climate Zone 3, someone in my office had it outside because she didn't model garage to put it into. Michelle is listening, so I know she knows the story. And her compliance margins were absolutely horrible. But the minute she moved it into a garage, because she modeled a garage, was able to put it in the garage, the compliance margin came into line with what we were expecting. So this is going to affect your compliance. When we talk about multifamily central systems, uh, the big news here is that in the next version of software, we will finally finally, I think it's a little too soon actually, be able to model central heat pump water heaters and that's really to help those cities that are going trying to push electrification. But we have an awful lot of different ways we're going to go about controlling our recirculation loops. Please read up on what these are. Um, don't just assume like this temperature modulation plus monitoring. That's an extremely expensive system. And are they prepared 
to put in that type of control to the recirculation pumps. Yeah, it gave you a nice compliance margin, but do you understand what that's doing to the model? Okay, so really keep up on what's the technology out there. With our CF1Rs, the NIA 3 is really 100%, um, really has front and center. They really are supporting that well, I feel, in the CF1R and where that tank is going to be located. So our plans examiners, our building inspectors are going to be able to look at this and go, wow, I see the tank outside or I see it within the conditioned space, you know, in a closet next to the kitchen. That's not what it says here in this report. We really need to, to be looking at those. We see drain water heat recovery where it's all about how many uh, shower drains are you um, putting the system into play. You get some credit for that. It's something that I think is a little scary. Make sure you understand what you're signing up for. So now that we've gone through plumbing, we have a check your understanding question for you. So uh, let's go to our last check your understanding question for the day. And this is really important. How often should you update your compliance software? So Martin, does your software um, always tell people when there's a software update? Because i got to tell you, this 8.04 caught me by surprise. I uh, emailed Martin yesterday complaining about something not documenting correctly, and he had to tell me, Gina, just download the latest update. Are you guys always really good about telling us about the updates, and I just ignored the message? Um, first off, do help check for updates. But the thing is, Gina, we were going to put out the Energy Pro News uh, announcement of, of the update, but I'd already put out an Energy Pro News announcement of these classes, and I wanted to keep the classes top set, uh, you know, at the top of the list of announcements so people would pay attention. Um, after uh, today, tomorrow, since we've got the last class tomorrow, I'm going to pull that announcement off, and I'm going to put the announcement of the 8.04 8 there. So it really just had to do with I wanted people to attend these classes so that they could get all this information. But uh, the, the thing about the updates, you know, I, I can guarantee that in, in about a week or two, according to Deanne, we're going to have uh, another one. And um, Larry had told me we'll probably have another one uh, later in March as well. So anyway. Uh, we be are Whoever said never, you and I need to talk, okay? Whoever responded never, call me. You and I need to have a deep, serious conversation to talk to you like I talk to my teenage kids. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Let's go back to. At least somebody didn't put down hourly like they did this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to our presentation and start talking to you about where you can get help after today. So I'm really hoping you're not feeling too overwhelmed and that you got something and that this two hours was well worth your value. Um, at Energy Code Ace, we have a lot of classes to help support you. So under our training tab, um, I want to point out that there we have these filters. And these filters, and I can't find my arrow, and there it is. These filters are really important so that you don't feel overwhelmed. So here I click the filter. I want live trainings. I don't want to know about recordings. I want live trainings. I also said I want the 2019 standards. I don't want anything about 2016 or 2013. And I even went further into this topic. So i got to tell you, this topic list goes on and on and on. And I went almost all the way to the end and grabbed, I want topics only associated with modeling. I, in fact, took CBAC and ISVE off the list because, well, I don't do that software. <laughs> but, you know, you, you're going to use the filters. And you'll see that we have quite a bit of training going on. Uh, Martin, tell them a little bit about this residential modeling class and why even our high-end users should think about attending this class. Well, the thing about these classes, Gina, is we like to focus on a lot of the new stuff that's being introduced into the code and how to properly apply these things. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but some of our worst offenders for not keeping their, their skills updated are the older users, and not necessarily older as in age, I mean older as in more, quote, experience, because they kind of think they know everything. And I got to tell you, with this mm -hmm. 2019 code change, you know, <laughs> and so these classes are really important. So, you know, if you're a beginner, if you're advanced, it really will come in handy in both cases. So, And it is with the live instructors, so it's going to take into consideration who's attending this class. 
So we have this for non-res, we have it for residential, and you'll also notice that all the training centers support um, software classes also. You can see Martin in person to see the introduction and also the intermediate advanced classes. Uh, check with your local utility calendar. Martin, you also list these, don't you, in your software with the uh, um, current events? Um, we don't list them with the current events, but we have links onto these um, pages now uh, at, to the various utilities, the energy centers and all that stuff, as well as the ACE stuff, so that people can get access to their calendars. Um, we try not to put our own calendar out, uh, just because sometimes there's conflicts with other people's calendars, classes get moved. I just had a class uh, recently that just got moved from, um, where was it, Torrance to Alhambra. Uh, so, you know, it's better to point to their calendars and let them know that, that, that they can let you know. Lots of opportunities to get up to date. Tomorrow, Martin and I are only going to be talking about how to use Energy Pro for non-residential, high-rise multifamily buildings and hotel motel. i got to tell you, there's some big changes that are going on with those building types. If you want to actually see someone use Energy Pro 8 and a lot of these features we talked about, not just all these pictures we're showing you, but live, um, Brian Selby does a Code and Coffee, um, oh gosh, what is this on? What's this platform? I forget, Martin. Uh, I'm not sure what platform. He, well, it's on YouTube, you mean. Uh, yes, YouTube. I'm like, it's a thing all young kids listen to these days. <laughs> I just aged myself. You That's going to be happening this Friday. And uh, that recording will be available on our website, too, if you miss it on Friday. If you want a copy of these slides, you're going to take my survey, because that's how we tell the CTUC we're using your funds correctly. And give us a couple weeks, and we'll send you a copy of our slide deck. Let's now talk about uh, how you can get your certificate of participation. Please make sure that you are sending me an email if you attended as a group, like I know my office did. You're going to send me an, a list of everyone's names and their email addresses so everyone gets their very own certificate. Give us a couple of weeks. You have Martin and I's contact information for after today. I think we're both easier to get via email, and don't ever try and call us. My uh, support team behind the curtain, they're part of how I can do this. The CEC hotline, because of course that's important to know. Jill Marber is our manager for the Decoding Talk series, so do feel free to reach out to her with any questions, concerns, or anything you'd like to talk to her about. And now we're taking the time to make sure we answered all the questions you guys have today. Do you guys have questions that were not answered? I thought we did pretty good answering them, but I could have missed. Are there any questions you guys have? You can also raise your hand, and we can get you to be able to talk out loud. But let's not do that, uh, Daryl, like we did this morning, unless someone raises their hand. Hey, I'll just point out to your tech <laughs> team, Gina, that uh, Jill Marber has a different uh, title now. It's principal. Oh, that's right. Daryl, let's update Jill's uh, title. She worked hard for that. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions happen, so we're yeah, going to let you guys hold on, hold on. move on with the hold rest on, of I'm, your I'm, Thursday. Are, hold on, are there any classes for architects and builders? Yes, um, we. Oh, are, I didn't see that one. Yeah, we do. We do have <laughs> classes in Energy Code Ace that are specifically geared towards architects. In fact, I think I might even be signed up for a couple of them to teach. So check check that out, John. At, uh, Energy Code Ace. Um, we have uh, an in-person class just for non-res architects where we really dive deep, and that's offered at all the training centers. Like I said earlier, our decoding talk we did on residential design really should be something that everyone takes a look at. We even give a plan set away how to support QII. And uh, we are actually in the process of developing a residential architect class that we hope will be available at some point earlier in this year. And um, here we're seeing SDG &E offers Title 24 for architects, guys. All these training centers have an amazing training retinue of programs that are sometimes unique to their training center or not. Definitely take a look at what's available at your training center in addition to what's available through Energy Code Ace. Who's the great trainer that often teaches that one for SDG? &E? Oh, there's a couple. I thought you taught them all. I do the non-res one. Yeah, for an SDGD. Yeah. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have fun with that class. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Martin, I'll see you tomorrow. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody.